NPC to, to ILM, you might have heard of ILM, uh, quite a while ago now. Uh, so it's double negative in between, That's which right. was Wonder Woman and Star Trek, and then ILM about a year ago. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not, not going to get in the way now, I'm just going to switch the lights off and let uh, Josh tell his story, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, round of applause. So, oh my god. Hello everybody! I am, uh, hello. <laughs> that was it. Uh, I'm Josh Parks, as Saint said. I'm a compositor, which is basically Photoshop <laughs> for moving image. Um, I'm a compositor at Industrial Light and Magic in London. So basically, uh, I work for Mickey Mouse because Disney bought ILM very recently from George Lucas. And uh, yeah, and they, I mean, we make Star Wars, uh, Avengers, other films that I'm sure you've heard of, but I would like to show you some breakdowns from Star Wars, if I may. Because that's what you all work, that's the reason you're here, you, can, you, can't, you have to stay, by the way, for the rest of the talk. <laughs> Scare you! 
So there you go. That's the magic bit that we do. Um, so. So, my clients, who have I worked for over the years? As Saint said, I've worked for uh, Double Negative, um, MPC. I started off at MPC in, um, in a junior position. They uh, had an academy that they invited two people on every six months to be a compositor. It's called Comp Academy, funny enough. Uh, you did six months of roto scoping, which is where you cut out things. So you kind of draw around them and cut them out. Then we did two, uh, six months of prep which is where you paint out markers and all of that kind of stuff. And then six months compositing, which is similar to what you saw there. So green screens, we'd remove green screens, um, take renders of the Millennium Falcon and put those behind various different things. So that's what I did at MPC. When I became a compositor, I was there for another year working on uh, The Martian, uh, Exodus. My last film was Jungle Book there, which is really cool. John Favreau is like the best guy to work for. He's really nice. And he came into the office and people were taking pictures from various things. Uh, double negative, I went, then went there and I worked on Wonder Woman first of all, which is really cool, and then Star Trek as well. And then now, as uh, Saint said, I'm in Industrial Light and Magic, where I've just finished on Transformers the last night. And then I'm now on a Steven Spielberg film called Ready Player One, which is looking incredible. It looks so good. Uh, I'm very excited about it. So, so that's uh, my kind of day job, so to speak. And then as you know, I do this because that's why I'm here now. So I work for a company called CG Spectrum and we do, I do online teaching. So I taught people in Israel, I teach a guy in Thailand, in Australia, where else? Brazil, all sorts, all around the world. And we have an hour a week chat and talk about their work and I show them some cool things to improve on, etc. So that's something I do four hours a week as well. Then I also do this, so I come to universities because I really enjoy meeting you guys and it's, it's really fun. Um, so I do that as well. So I went to, I was lucky enough to be invited to Denmark at the VIA, VIA University. Uh, Norway as well, which is really cool. Um, Norwich, funnily enough. And Hertfordshire. And then I also write um, every now and then for a magazine called 3D World, which is kind of the in, uh, in this area is kind of like main magazine. It's 3D Artist or 3D World, the two main ones. So I do a bit of writing for them as well. Because I'm not very good at writing, so I like to get better at it. So what films have I worked on? Well, here's a list of some of them. So it starts off Maleficent being my first one. That was when I did Roto, so I was cutting out Angelina Jolie and making it like she was flying around everywhere. Um, then Gardens of the Galaxy. And as I was telling the second years who I'm teaching, uh, I was teaching this morning, I was also doing Roto, but what we had is, so when you don't have a green screen behind someone, you have to have someone to cut out whatever it is because you, you can no longer go tell the computer what the green screen is because there isn't a green screen behind them. So I had to do Roto of, do you know Gamora of Gardens of the Galaxy? She's uh, the female protagonist. Um, so she was hitting what we called the blue burrito, which is a guy in a blue morph suit with a blue kind of like foam thing around him. And he's just, he's just whacking him. And uh, there's no green screen behind her hair. So I had to go in and hand roto each hair out and then match the motion blur as well. So, um, and luckily I didn't smash my face in with a brick after doing that. So, uh, <laughs> so we then went on to Terminator, which I got to do some compositing, which was great. It was great fun. Um, Exodus was also compositing. I don't think it's up there. The Martian, which was an amazing film to work on again. Uh, if you, how, I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, ideally, if you could try and see it in 3D if you can, because the, um, stereographer, the guy who was in charge of the 3D bit, really cared about that. And you get these amazing shots. So, um, so I've got a great story. I was hung over working on that once and we had to come in on a weekend. And um, I had to put dust in layers in depth, in 3D depth. And I was there not feeling very well with these 3D glasses on being like, oh God, this is just horrible. It's just like the worst thing. So, um, but that was an amazing show to work on. And I got invited, got nominated for an Oscar. And a few of us um, were invited to the London Oscar party, which was amazing. It was incredible. We were just drinking like espresso martinis all night and then celebrating. And um, so that was really cool. And then worked on Spectre, which was compositing. Very simple work on that one. Uh, not much. It was kind of set extension, that environment. Um, and as I said, Jungle Book, which was incredible to work on. It was a dream client and the film was amazing. And everyone was just really excited. And uh, it was really, really cool. Uh, and then Transformers, which is a recent one, um, which was which was great. Again, it was cool. Just I got to design. I don't know who's seen it, but there's a Transformer called Hot Rod, 
and his arm kind of turns into a gun for enough it transforms into a gun and uh and he goes to take a shot and i got to design kind of how his gun shot which was like the coolest thing ever so i was like sending ideas to michael bay and being like is it glowy enough <laughs> it's like do you want eight more lens flares so i can shake the cap so uh he approved that that was good and then uh, again at double negative was on star trek which was uh really fun that was really fun uh, and wonder woman as well which is also a really cool film it's nice to work on a decent dc film um so yes yeah, so <laughs> uh and then yeah at the moment i'm on ready player one which again is incredible and i it, it just looks amazing i'll show you a bit of that a bit later so what i do work for industrial light and magic as a compositor and here is the latest release of ready player one from Dreamcon. <laughs> I live here in Columbus, Ohio. In 2045, it's still ranked the fastest growing city on Earth. But it sure doesn't seem like it when you live in the stacks. They called our generation the missing millions. Missing not because we went anywhere. There's nowhere left to go. Nowhere. Except the Oasis. place that feels like I mean anything. A world where the limits of reality are your own imagination. There you go, that's what I'm currently working on at the moment, which is pretty good. And it's pretty amazing as well, because it's got like the DeLorean in it, the Akira bike, and all these other Easter eggs. Which is amazing actually, because uh, Steven Spielberg loves that stuff. So we keep uh, looking at YouTube videos, all the stuff he's trying to reference, and trying to put as many, like hide as many Easter eggs in it as we can. So that's really fun. Uh, this actually I'm announcing today. You guys are the first people to know about this. So as you guys know, I do a bit of teaching. Um, I now have a website especially for my teaching. Um, I've been doing webinars and things which I do in my own time as well. Just again, people around the world want to learn stuff from me, so I do <laughs> webinars and do hangouts. And this is where I'm hosting it. So it's compositingpro.com. Uh, it's all my teaching stuff. I've got kind of like resources if you want to be a compositor. There's resources that I found useful, other people's resources, not mine. Um, my upcoming webinars, I run a newsletter. <laughs> Now, which has got quite a lot of people reading it now. I run a newsletter and it's uh, once a month I try and kick something out with. Here's a load of articles I've been reading. See what you think of them. Um, so that's on there as well. And all sorts of things. I kind of just put it on there. It's, it, it's, my teaching stuff was getting quite big. So I kind of, this is all, it's all on that website now. So compositingpro.com uh, is where that's all hosted. As I said, 3D World, I, um, I wrote a six six article series on nuke compositing a uh, beginners kind of course that and it, basically i came out of university and was really frustrated that i'd got into the industry and now learned all this stuff and i was thinking well why is no one teaching it it's so obvious when you get in so i emailed 3d world and kind of uh, they agreed that they should do some of this stuff so I, I now kind of do bits and bobs with them for nuke which again i really enjoy i was always crap at writing at school so I, I, it was nice trying to get better at writing and reading up how to get better at it and things uh, CG Spectrum, as I said, online teaching tutorial company, and I teach people all over the world. And then the newsletter, um, which again I just said, uh, I run it. It runs out um, 
once a month to people within the industry as well. So it, it's got a real mix of students and people in the industry. So the articles are kind of, uh, they're, they're not at a certain level, they're kind of a mixture. And it's a great uh, resource just in cards to like put people to send me stuff that they found useful and I kick it out. And again, universities. So uh, it's meant I can travel to Norway and Denmark and see these amazing places and even Norwich I've seen, which is incredible. And uh, uh, Hertfordshire and, um, and then Greenwich University as well and a few other ones. So it, it's really fun doing this kind of stuff. So now the next part of the talk is that's kind of about me. And that's, that's I've big myself up enough now. So uh, this, this, uh, what I want to do now is because you guys aren't just VFX students, right? You guys are, actually, I'm going to go back so I can see. Um, you guys aren't just VFX students. You are film, you are media photography, I think, some of you, whatever kind of area you're in. I'm going to now tell you some stuff that I've kind of learned throughout my career. And I haven't like, worked these out for myself. Generally, smarter people have just kind of made a note and then tried to live by it or steal the idea. So I'm going to kind of pass these on to you now. Um, and I feel like a lot of this stuff, I mean, it's going to improve your chance of getting a job massively. If not, it will make you get a job. So make a note of them uh, if you can. Uh, they're very simple, but um, it's just something I really want to pass on to you guys. I'm very passionate about artists being able to make a living out of what they enjoy. And you can do it. So, so. oh, could we have the lights down again? Sorry. Sorry, man. <laughs> it's just the one thing is uh, dark, so we're good. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, forums. Okay, so, and it's all about presence. So, why be present? Well, when you leave university, you want people within your chosen area to know your name, ideally. You don't have to be known to be the best person, but you have to be known for somebody who learns a lot and wants to learn, and if they're given a chance, will do very well. So, this is something you need to think about, okay? You, you need to be posting up on forums, have a presence, start getting feedback on your work from people within the industry. It's amazing how, again, when I was at university, I would email people and ask them, if, could they have a look at my work? I love what you're doing here. It's been incredibly inspiring for me while I was studying at university. Would you mind just giving me some feedback? And it, it's incredible to see these people, like lots of people love it. We all love it in industry because if you think about it, we're working on a film and we're not really ever getting the kind of, we, we never really get the, we never get get all the, um, if we work on a shot, no one knows it's our shot, okay? So if someone comes up to us like, oh, I love what you did on this show, it's really nice getting that. And that people will happily help you out. Because again, it, it's, the industries are all full of nice people. That's the great thing about the creative industry. Generally, the nicer the people are, the better they do. Um, so forums, post your work up on forums, whatever area you're in, get feedback. One thing as well, which is a little kind of like form hack, get, if a load of you sign up to forums, and what you'll find is, oh, my, no one's read my thing and it's gone to the bottom of the forum. Just get your mate to post on it and that bumps it back up to the top again. And then you can just keep doing it until someone else posts on it. So, uh, yeah, by all means, you've got to play the system a little bit. So, okay, second of all, website. You need to have an online presence. So, let's say you post up on a forum, you show a piece. Well, you want people to then be able to, if they really like your stuff, where's the rest of their stuff? How do I email them? How do I do all this? Well, they can then click on your website. They go there, it's got your about page, it's got your demo reel, etc. So that's why you want this. Think of it as kind of like an online CV. I know everyone says LinkedIn is that, but no one really uses LinkedIn. So make your own website. If you want a cheap way to do it, uh, get some hosting and install WordPress. Get a theme from ThemeForest. You can set up a website in half a day. You don't have to learn about HTML and all that stuff. Uh, you just install it and then you can drag and drop and things. Um, there's lots of tutorials on how to do that. And also if you haven't already, buy your domain name which is the bit like mine is joshparks.co.uk, you buy, buy that now. So buy your name, .co.uk or whatever. It's like six pounds on one, two, three, reg, dot, whatever. I'm, I'm not sponsored by them or affiliate link or anything. Uh, so to get that on there, that's important. Uh, meetups as well. Again, this is a great way for people to know that you're a nice person. Probably, believe it or not, like you can teach someone how to click buttons and that kind of stuff. And here's how to do a key as we were talking about this morning. Here's how to do a technique. You can't go just just being nice, but like you can't sit, you can't teach some of that. So that and that's incredibly important. Again, when you go to a meetup and you meet people from the industry you want to go into, if they get along with you, they'll be more likely to hire you than if they don't get along with you. It's it's simple, but they need to know that. So you need to go see these people in real life. So, like so, you got they've got a name and a face behind it, behind just your website and your work online. Lots of the forums have have these kind of meetups. 
I know when I was studying, uh, one of my friends was doing games and there's like poly counts, a big one for games. Um, and they have huge, I mean, they have almost like really good meetups. Uh, he's now in the US um, working on Gears of War. Uh, and they used to have meetups out there and stuff. So uh, yeah, go to meetups. I think there's Bring Your Own Animation in London, which is a good one, and a few others. So if you can, go to them. Uh, Sigraph London is one as well that I went to a few weeks ago. And there's loads of students. You can talk to recruiters. You can see people in the industry. It's just good to just kind of be part of the community. It'll make you want to work harder as well. <coughs> You'll start being part of the community. So here's what I did. I worked outside. So what does that mean? Well, everyone who leaves university is gonna come out with, exact, with pretty much the same show rule. If, you all, if you've all been given the same briefs, a lot of you are gonna come out with the same, the same show rule, or work, or portfolio. So what I used to do is um, email people outside of work. Again, you, you, a Kickstarter wasn't a big thing when I was in you, but email Kickstarter, Indiegogo, all of those stuff, they will love you to work for, I mean, you're students, you, you, don't, you don't need much to live, <laughs> like, just email them, and they'll be happy, get, happily give you kind of like amazing video footage or etc. Again, this is mainly for the VFX film guys, or maybe they need a, a DP or a sound guy or photography, on-set photography, go do it, put yourself out there, you've got nothing to lose. Worst thing, if, if they don't email you back, then you're in exactly the same position as you're in now, so it's a, it's a huge win. Um, so that's what I did. I emailed out. Actually, a guy came into university looking for help. I was the only one that emailed him back. And it meant I got to play around with some uh, Red Epic footage, which is like a 50 grand camera. And because I was the only one, he was at working at Framestore, which is another big VFX company. He, was just, he would just help me one on one because I was working on his film for free and he wanted it done well. So he had to train me a little bit. So it was amazing. I mean, you, you couldn't buy that. It's, it's incredible. So that's what I did. And then it meant that, then meant that I had pieces in my showreel that are to a professional level and no one else has got them in their showreel. So instantly I'm, I'm completely uh, moving myself to the side and going, look at my stuff. It's completely different to the others. Because if everyone's got the same piece, it's very easy to just look at two pieces and go, which one of these is better? Because it's no longer kind of a subjective thing. It's more just like, okay, which technically is better? So if you've got pieces from industry and stuff, number one, someone's taken the risk on you and it shows that you can work to a professional standard. And number two, you've just got something cool in your reel that instead of having a DSLR footage on a, a 550D or 5D or whatever, you've just got a really nice footage. So, and it's the same, it just shows you can work professionally. Feedback is incredibly important. And <laughs> this comes in two strands. Number one, always you always want to be asking for feedback. Um, in VFX especially, it's very easy because everyone watches films. Uh, so, I mean, you can show your parents a bit of VFX you do, and they might say something looks wrong, but they won't know why. And the professionals, obviously, I make a living out of it because I do know why. So, but everyone can generally see if something isn't, doesn't look right or doesn't look good. Um, but the problem in our industries are that it's a subjective thing. No one's opinion is more valid than another person's opinion when it comes down to non-technical details. So what this means is you have to kind of, and I learned a lot of this at art college, I went to art college for a year before university, and you, everyone's got an opinion, so you have to start knowing who you're gonna listen to. Um, and you will come up with your own filters for that and you'll know the right people. Um, but yeah, it, it's knowing about who to listen to. And, number, and the second strand <coughs> is find, find feedback. If you're a good friend, you'll give great critique on someone's work. I, it was really interesting, my group of friends, um, we were very good at university simply because we would give honest feedback. We wouldn't tell each other that our work was great. We would just say why it was wrong. And it wasn't like, that's almost a better friend because they're trying to get you your job in industry that you want. And if you keep just getting told that your work's good and then you get to the end and you don't get a job, well then your work wasn't, it wasn't good. It may be good, but it wasn't good enough. So again, you need people, if, you're, if you've got a group, great group of mates, Get everyone to go, why, is, why does this not look good? Or why, does it, why is this not right? What have I done wrong here? Because everyone knows something that you don't know. So you're trying to kind of pull that out from people. Start small. You guys all saw that I wrote for 3D World. Well, they're a bigger magazine. They're not gonna take, again, I said I can't write very well. So uh, they're not gonna take a risk on me. Why take a risk on me? They've got this huge publication, why do it? Well, you need qualifiers. Um, and what this means is it makes it so you seem less of a risk. Number one, I had a company like MPC, which I mentioned in the email, that's a qualifier. Um, number two, start, as I said, start small. So 
before 3D World, I really wanted to write for 3D World, but I knew they weren't gonna let me write for them while I was a student. So, I, and again, I needed some qualifiers. So number one, I waited till I was in the industry. And the second thing is I wrote for a small company who doesn't really have anyone write for them much who's in industry. It's kind of like hobbyist write for them called CG Tuts Plus. Um, and I approached them and because I, if I'm practicing, I want to get paid to practice. Like I can't, there's no point in me working through. I want to get paid to practice. So I emailed CG Tuts Plus and said, I've got this amazing piece in my showreel, which is kind of a city shot. Uh, I would love to do an art, a tutorial for you. I've never written a tutorial for, but I'd love to write a tutorial for you. And they said yes, and they paid me, paid me a decent amount to do it. So I said yes, and, uh, and then I did it. And then it ended up being, because no one really wrote for them who was in industry, it was then the most shared and most viewed Nuke tutorial, because there's only four. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and mine was like the non-hobbyist one. So, so it was then the most shared and most viewed. So I went to Free, Free New World and went, I've written the most shared and most viewed uh, tutorial on CG Touch Plus. And uh, I mean, I did, uh, I did. I, they just didn't know I'd left out some of the other bits. Uh, so, um, so yeah, that was another qualifier. And I linked them to it and said, look, Here's what I can do for you. And you'll generally find that as well if you're an artist. Um, you may find it frustrating, but you kind of just have to pay the bills. Um, so what I used to have is when I first started out, people would look at my show and be like, we just want you to do that. Can you just do that, but for us, from the bit different? Um, and, and a lot of places do want that. They don't want to take a risk on you at first until you make a bit of a name for yourself. So you do have to do a bit of that. And again, that's what I did here. I started small, find a website that I'm now kind of a bit of an expert uh, that and I've got a bit more kind of expertise than other people make a bit of a name for yourself there and then you can email the bigger guys and go look what I did for them and I've proved it and I've got a link to it here and mentioned the bigger name so start small work your way up don't aim for the big guys because they're not going to email you back straight away don't be a dick uh, so just yeah just don't be a dick it's as simple as that it's not gonna it uh, these are very small industries People will know if you're a pain in the arts to work with, people just won't hire you. It's amazing. Like, again, my industry, people go to New Zealand. A load of my mates are in New Zealand at the moment, working at Weta over there. Um, <coughs> I've got mates in Vancouver, in Montreal. Everyone knows each other. And it, it'll be the same in all you guys' industry as well. So just don't be a dick. It's just pointless, and these people just end up not getting jobs. Mentors. As I said, when you meet people, um, where in these meetups or on forums, you can meet good people and they'll quite happily say, okay, yeah, you can just email me once a month or whatever and I'll happily look at your work. You need mentors. It's as simple as that. I, again, I'm, I'm here because I've listened to smarter people than me who knew more stuff. And I, I, you just don't go in with an ego, just learn as much as you can. And I was very lucky to have, have been mentored by a lot of people. And these kind of inadvertent mentors, I'd sit next to people, get on with them, just like chat and get on with them, and then I'd ask them for a bit of help, and then they'd come back and help me out a bit. That's, that's all that is. And again, on forums, people might really like how, again, if you work really hard, people will really want those people in industry, and they, they love seeing that. So if you work really hard and keep posting things up on forums, people will say, and you ask for someone's help, they will be happy to do it. If, you, if you've Googled it, and you've kind of gone the general routes and you spent four hours trying to solve it and then you email them, they're, they're happy to do it. So find mentors, that's, that's, that's a huge, huge one. You're not gonna learn everything at university. That's just, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Luck. So a lot of your career will come down to luck, but today I'm gonna to teach you how to kind of make your own luck. And it's worked for me, so it should work for you as well. So. Luck is just when preparation meets opportunity. Okay, that's all luck is. So we can make, now we've split it into those two things. Here's how we make luck. Preparation, where we just work our asses off, basically. That's as simple as that. So you work hard, you post up on forums, all of this stuff, you're getting your feedback. Opportunity, how do you make yourself opportunities? You want as many opportunities as possible. So if you work your ass off in your room, and aren't making up any opportunities because you're not posting up online, well, then you're not gonna get lucky and get that break. If you just keep posting up online, but you, ha you haven't done any of the hard work and prepared in your room, well then you're not gonna get lucky. So you need to balance these two. So again, work hard, that's the preparation. 
And the opportunities bit, post up online. Go to meetups and you'll find that eventually people will offer you opportunities of, oh, hey, do you fancy doing this? Do you fancy doing this? And the bigger your network, the more opportunities you have. And, and then the better you get, the more prepared you are. So you get more lucky and lucky and lucky and lucky. And it's a, it's a string of events. That's just how it works. That's what luck is. And that applies to everything in your life. That's all luck is. To be lucky. An unconventional life. Um, as an artist, we are forced to live unconventional lives. Uh, one question I get a lot from students is, I'm a bit worried because uh, it's, it's all contract based and you only have a three month contract and a six month contract. And what do I do and what do I do? I mean, there's no job security and you read things on forums about people moaning and all this kind of stuff. Well, us artists have an unconventional life. We don't have a nine till five. We're maybe not gonna have a great pension and all this stuff. But that's fine, I guarantee you that is absolutely fine. You will live an unconventional life that is great, okay? For instance, I knew a guy in film who'd work six months on film and then spend six months just traveling the world because he'd make enough in that point because he's contracting so he's charging more. He'd make enough in that to be able to travel the world. Again, I can come here and do this and then I can teach my spare time. I could just, at the end of Ready Player One, I could stop and just teach and just teach four hours a week online if I want. You live an unconventional life the benefits can be other people's downsides and the downsides to other people can be other people's benefits. Again, our industries, there is no language for it. We have no language barrier pretty much. Again, we have to work with people, but our language is visual, which is, which is the same everywhere pretty much. I mean, again, people maybe like certain colors and certain cultures like certain other things, but it, it's a visual thing. So again, I've got friends who have moved to New Zealand for a bit They've then moved to Vancouver for a bit. They've then worked in New York for a little bit and worked in ads and made a killing. And then they've taken like six months off and then they've gone to LA and then they've worked in Australia. I mean, it's amazing. It's an amazing, amazing life you can have for yourself, but you've got to build it for yourself. It's, no, it's not a, a defined career progression. You can do whatever you want. So take inspiration. <laughs> Um, and this is something I do a lot as well with my newsletter um, and with my writing and that kind of things. But I, I, and by still, I mean, I don't steal from people within my industry because then you get caught. <laughs> 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 what you do is, so for instance, I really like, uh, I don't know if anyone's designing, but there's a guy called Tobias Van Schneider, who's a designer guy and he's quite big in the design world. And I look at what he does and I was like, oh, that guy's got a newsletter. That's a really, really cool idea. He also has like a Spotify playlist that he makes. And I was like, oh, I can't really be asked to do that. But he, has a, <laughs> but he has a newsletter that he does. And I was going, oh man, I could do a newsletter. That'd be great. And no one's doing that in my industry. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then I was going, oh, actually that guy also writes as well. And he does, he does talks at Google. So I'm trying to work out how I can get into companies and do talks as well like this. But um, but yeah, just steal from all the other places. Look at all the best people in all the other industries and see what they're doing. You'll generally, I tell you what, it's really weird. You'll find patterns generally. Um, and that's kind of why I'm telling you this stuff because these are the kind of patterns that I've seen. But steal from other industries because then you don't get caught. That's my, that's my tip to you. Uh, and just look at all the best people and see what other industries are doing better than you. At the moment in visual effects, we have a big thing where uh, people are maybe worried about their jobs moving abroad. Um, and a great way, again, you could be worried. That's completely emotional. I can understand that. However, let's look at another industry, design. How does that work when that's gone abroad? Other, other industries might be further ahead of you on their cycle. So you can look at <coughs> others and work out, have a rough estimate as what's going to happen in your industry. So always be looking left and right. Don't just be looking at the guy who's the best in your industry. Look at the best in the others and then you can, and then add your own little thing to it. So you have personality. And then that's yours. You can make it whatever you want. And what I find for me as well, the reason I love doing this, and I do it with websites as well. Again, if you want a color scheme, I just go find a website I like and nick the color scheme. Same with the layout. But why not? Because otherwise, I know what I want. I want to make a website. The, the hardest thing is coming up with the idea sometimes, but I, d I don't need to make an amazing website. I'm not a web designer. That's not how I make a living, and that's not what I enjoy. So I want to make that as painless as possible. And that's how I make it as painless as possible. So take inspiration from other people, still the best bits. Work-life balance. This is a huge one. Um, 
This is something that I've tried to work on a little better this year. As you see, I do a lot of things, so I'm trying to kind of chill out a little more. Um, and this is a massive one. If you, and the reason why it's a massive one is some people maybe think, oh, I have to do too much outside and I should work more. Well, if you really love, really, really love what you do, the problem is you find that you work a lot more and then, and then you kind of forget about the other stuff that also matters, but you can get a bit tunnel visiony. So this is a huge one. It, it's something, I don't know, if you guys find an answer for it, I'd love to know, but it's a real, it's a struggle. <laughs> there you go, and there's a little diagram of work-life balance. And then, so I'm just gonna finish with one thing that um, really helped me get through, guys, really helped me get through second and third year. Uh, and it's a great way I find to, uh, just if you're working on a tough problem that's really tough, it's a great way to kind of, I think, well, it helps me to think about it in my head to help me kind of get through it. So if you really, really want something, and you know you really want it, every day you will wake up and the world will go, how much do you want this thing? And generally everyone will say, oh, I want it, I want it a lot, I want it very much. And then the world will say, prove it. And then you'll go and then you'll sit down and do some work and then it'll get tough. Or then maybe your mates are going out, so you go out and you didn't prove it. And then, and then it will say, prove it again. And you get stuck again and you push through for four hours trying to find that button or you're trying to find that camera setting or whatever, but then you do it. And then it says, prove it again. And then you get stuck again. And it's the people who prove it the most amount of times to the world that they really want it. They're the ones that actually get the thing that they want. It's as simple as that. You have to keep turning up and proving that you want it and then you'll get it. So uh, there we go. My name's been Josh Parks and I hope you enjoyed and that helped you out. Thank you. We've got time for questions, which is great. <coughs> we planned this meticulously. And um, because I'm here, I get a chance to ask the first question. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I like the hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready. I like it. I've got the mic. Um, so, um, my first question, Josh, is, uh, you know, the VFX industry, like other industries, is kind of global now. Yeah. So what happens in London gets sent around the globe so other people can work on it, etc. How much do students like this need to know about working in teams, and especially how to work in kind of virtual teams? Because yeah. our VFX guys are going to be working with uh, a film school in London at Ealing Studios soon. Yeah. So they need to they can't be at Ealing Studios every day and commute yeah they need to understand about making virtual teams and stuff like that so I don't know if you've had any experience with that yeah what do you need to say about that yeah so generally I would say work out what they're going to do wrong work out where they're going to make the mistakes and then fix it ahead of time okay so let's say like for instance on uh, Transformers everyone was knackered because we'd all worked very hard well, I started making things idiot-proof in my work. I would be just label stuff that was like, this, this is where this thing is, or definitely change this thing. So if you're going to work with film students, again, it's tough. Maybe ask the film students here, what will you screw up on? Like, what? No, but, no, but ask them, like, well, like, do exactly what you're going to do with those guys, and, say, and then see where they make the mistakes, and then you can learn from that, and then think ahead when it comes to it. So I think that's it, just putting yourself in their shoes and thinking where they're gonna make the stakes and then already covering those bases before they're made. I think it's the way to make it smooth. Thank you. Okay, let's have some questions from the audience. Hands up, Nathan was first. Do you see yourself working abroad? Like, did you have mates that have worked abroad? Yeah. Do you see yourself staying in London or? I, uh, I, th I really want to work abroad uh, before I kind of like have a fab, like have people relying on me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think so. I really fancy New York at the moment. Um, and it may, like again, it, ads would be interesting. It's kind of like a new challenge. Um, yeah, I would like to. I would like to. They get, the great thing is that the opportunity is always there. So but that almost makes it about, you almost want it to be kind of going away in a week, so then you have to take it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think I will do eventually. Luckily, my uh, girlfriend's in design, so she can kind of do it, do things elsewhere, so. Do you see, like, to work abroad, do you have to be better than the people already there, or do you just move yourself over there, or do you have to sort of get them to you have uh, they sponsor you so they have to pay for your visa right. so you do have to be quite good um, I mean they, they will happily move you around um, to the country so generally there's a big thing in the VFX industry where we have um, industry subsidies 
So the country trying to get VFX work into their country say, we'll give you 30% of whatever you spent here. So sometimes that can um, push people around because now VFX companies move to the countries where the subsidies are, so everyone moves there. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a difficult. One. But you, Canada particularly, yes, uh, most recently Canada for games and for the effects. Yeah, the, which you get great offers. Yeah, and it's interesting. Even like the different, but like uh, Montreal has a forty percent tax break, and Vancouver has a twenty five. But it, even these places are all competing against each other. So that kind of dictates where you can go, and then you can pick from there, kind of where you want to be. But you don't have to be amazing. Uh, I think it's just you need to be kind of better than the regular level because they actually have to prove that they've searched everywhere in Canada for someone to do this role and you were the only guy so uh, to get you into the country. So you end up going over like a bit of paper like that thick of just huge documentation proving that they searched everywhere and they couldn't find you. So, yeah. Um, so you worked on a lot of big films for Hollywood yeah. Are you, um, have there been any scenes you've worked on that have been cut that were due to rewrites of the director? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how, how did you deal with that uh, you know, scene being cut? It, uh, when you first start out, I remember, so again, the, the Roto thing is our Sam with Gamora's hair. We did it on Maleficent, the main guy, who's the guy in, actor in District 9 as well. He was the knight and he was spinning around. And it was probably the best bit of work I'd ever done. I was really looking forward to putting it in my showreel. And then it got cut and things like that so and that's a bit heartbreaking at first but again it was I learned a lot so it's I think it, it's more painful at the start when you when you want to just get as much work for your por professional work for your portfolio as you can but uh, once you've got that you kind of you just accept that that's part of the industry um, yeah unfortunately it's all part I tell you one thing that we always laugh about is in the prep department where we have to paint things out within the shop um, so we were asked in Maleficent to paint out one of the extras and we felt really heartbroken. We were like, oh, this is his big break. And we're just like, hey, we're, we're imagining him at the cinema waiting for this one shot. And that's me. Oh, what the hell? It's just a brick wall. Because we uh, paint him out. So, I mean, it, it, it's a bit annoying at first, but you get used to it. It's part of it. And also, you have to remember, you got paid your day rate. So, worst thing's worst. At least you got paid for it. Another question? Come on, there must be a question, James. I know a lot of people um, are worried about industry being kind of a factory production line. What, yeah. what have your experience been with that sort of thing? Um. I think as films get bigger, they have to go a little bit towards. So generally what happens is, and this is all creative areas like this, you get kind of like the money guys and the production side who are saying that this is when it's due. And you get artists who just really enjoy doing the thing they do. Um, and you do need the production side. That's one thing you realize. Because us artists, if we're set no boundaries, we'll just keep, nothing's ever finished for us. We'll just keep working and working and working and working and working. And um, that's, no one ever will pay to do anything if it takes you 10 years to do something. So, and we need those, we need time frames. Otherwise it forces us to think differently, etc. cetera. Um, so, I mean, it has got a little bit like that to a certain extent, due, uh, purely out of necessity. On a big film, you need lots of people it needs to be a well oiled machine where you can pass one thing to one person to one person. But I would say the creativity hasn't gone. I mean, I, like, again, as a composter, I'm at the end of uh, everything. So everyone gives me their work and then I kind of put it all together and tweak it a bit. And I mean, I, what I make, the director sees and has to say yes or no to. That's, that's as simple as that. So it's pretty great. It's pretty great. Like, again, I, had to, I got to design the gun, the way the gun shot. I mean, it wasn't like someone was going just match that. Over there, you do need a bit of reference, but it, it's pretty creative still. I think, again, I can understand why people say that in regards to the warehouse, but, um, and if you feel like that, work for a smaller company. There's, again, it's, it's whatever you like. I just, I really enjoy doing this, this is what I do. If you really enjoy working for a smaller company where you get more say, work on a smaller production. It's, again, you, unconventional life. You can make what, out of it whatever you want. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um What's your experience been like working, like bouncing from major director to another major director to another one? Like, um, I mean, it, it can be tricky because uh, you get really good at uh, working on one guy's look, and then you work on another one, and, and then again on uh, Wonder Woman. It was a female director who had who really wanted to make a difference in the DC world. She did such a great job, uh, but she wanted it to look uh, quite different. So, um, again, as a as a corporate artist. You have to be able to do that. 
So it, it can be tricky, but but it's it's generally. I mean, most of the films look set fairly similar anyway. There's kind of like a general language across them all. So it, it can be a little. It's like the first two months are a bit of a pain because you're trying to work out what the director likes. And uh, then once you work out what they like, you just keep throwing that in your shots. So it isn't. It's not a huge a huge deal, I think. What's yeah. Oh. Um, do you not find it weird not having your own creative style? Like as photographers, we're taught to have your own visual thing, and yet you're just working on a tiny little bit yeah. in a film. Is that not straight into just sort of being a cog in a machine rather than? Um, yeah, I get. But here's the thing. So if you're a photographer and you want to earn a living, you need a client, right? So and the client will dictate the look that they want. Unless you're a huge name, then the client will dictate the look they want. So again, it's putting your if you if you want to do your own thing and your own look. <laughs> then you have to be the client. That's the only way you can do it. Or you have to be a big enough name for them to pay you for your style. But unfortunately, in the film industry, uh, for, for instance, like ASOS with their, with their photos, right? Those guys are photographers, but you can't tell who took what photo. So, so that's kind of the, the VFX way. There's loads of companies working on a film because it's, it's huge now, so lots of companies will, so we need a uniform look. So I agree, you can sometimes feel like a bit of a cog in the wheel when you're kicking stuff out. But you can add your own flares in. I mean, they're very subtle, but you can add those own flares in. And yes, you are not designing the whole style of something, but you are making an overall pack. It's like the iPhone. You don't know who made the box, who made the screen. Like, it has to come as one complete package that has a uniform language. So if you're a photographer, you, and you want to have your own language portrayed, then you need to find someone who either loves the way you do things or you need to do your own things. So I agree that it is the case that yes, I am more of a cog in a machine than someone who would just be able to do whatever they want every day. But then, I, but then for me, the trade-off is worth it because now I get to work on the bigger stuff that I, I enjoy more. Further down the line, that may not be the case. But uh, what I find is, this may not be the case in photography, um, you, you can learn lots of different skills in lots of different areas. So who knows, maybe those guys that do the ASOS photos are very good at quick setups and quick lighting. So you can now learn the best bits from all of them and then when you get older and you're more senior, you can, you can do what you want with the knowledge. Um, but yeah, you're right, it is a bit of a cog in a machine. Is the yeah. end. We had uh, a speaker, uh, speak Magali Barbe, and she worked on Working Woman as animated, but in her spare time she also made a yeah. short film, so it can happen for both of those. Yeah. Another question? Over there, sorry. Okay. Um, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> well, are there any moments where uh, there's like a scene that you want to do, like you really want to do? Like for example, Ready Player One is a book that was out in yeah. 2011. So, yeah. so it's, it's had quite a bit. Um, yeah. Quite a bit of time to you know, get settled in. You know, a lot of people know it. Yeah. So, yeah, I have that on. Funny, it's if you really love the story, um, then yeah, it, it can be that. Again, you generally do a few shots from everything, and you can ask. What I generally get is there's a shot that I really want um, that they've uh, visualized in a grayscale model, and then you go, oh man, that's a cool shot. I really want that shot. Um, so you find that's more the case, and you can ask. You can ask if you want to do it, you can ask. Because generally the people that ask you the shot will be the most passionate and work overtime and all that stuff and really go for it. Um, there was a shot on a film called The Finest Hours and it was kind of like a boat coming over a wave that I really wanted and I asked and it was kind of, I was a junior then, it was a senior shot and I asked and I got to do it. So I, you, it never hurts to ask these things, I'd say. So yeah, it, it does happen. Running out of time, so one more question and James first, sorry Kevin. Um, well, where do you go next for you? Like, have you got a vision of Because like, you're in a, a pretty amazing position now with what's at ILM. Is there like, in your head, have you got somewhere you want to go further? Maybe like, to be a first Yeah, that's what I'm trying <laughs> Maybe one day. Um, I mean, that's what I'm trying to work out at the moment. That's why I kind of like doing the side things, because at the moment, now uh, I do teaching, it's kind of like my own company. So, as you said, I'm no longer the cog in the wheel. This is, I can, when I was doing these webinars, I can make them however I want. And it's really awesome. Now I can make it my own little thing. Um, so I'm really enjoying that at the moment and kind of learning a bit of the businessy stuff and how to do that and that kind of thing. Um, 
I don't know. I just, I just kind of, I don't think there's any point in having a huge plan because otherwise you're gonna, that's gonna sway you a little bit. I kind of just go along and then if something, again, like here, I was got recommended to do this. Okay, I'll do that. And then that then led on to something else and that then led on to something else. Um, I never like to look too far ahead because it, it can never change then. If you're concrete in a way, then it, you kind of have to be a bit, but I think the next thing maybe will be um, doing more LM stuff or doing more of my own thing, taking that teaching bit further. Um, yeah, there's a few, a few things. Maybe making a Spotify playlist or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. well, we've run out of time now. We're only here some half past one. So thank you very much for coming. A round of applause. So you know, um, Josh will also in week nine be doing an ILM masterclass over three days here uh, with tips and tricks. A couple of places are still open for that. So email us. Thank cool. You. Thank you, guys. <laughs>